بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم والعن عداهم السلام عليكم Dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to another episode of The Valiant where we are looking to commemorate and celebrate the life of the most influential people in our history the Imams and the infallibles of the Holy Household of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam I am your presenter Ibrahim Al-Ansari and I am once again joined by our esteemed guest Samahat Sayyid Ali Nawab Assalamu alaykum Sayyidina Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullah How are you doing today? Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah, how are you? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, barakat du'akum uh, first and foremost, I would like to send my condolences to yourself, to the Imam of our time, to our great Maraj, and to the whole Islamic Ummah on the martyrdom occasion of Imam Jawad alayhi afdalu salati wa salam, this great noble Imam. Uh, and because I know there is uh, a lot to talk about when it comes to his life, uh, especially his Imam from a young age, uh, the short life that he lived and everything that he shared within that short life as well, uh, I would like to just start it off with a brief introduction into who Imam Jawad was and uh, let that be the stepping stone for the for the rest of the discussion. Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin wa la'anatullahi ala a'dahihim ajma'in ila abadi al-abidin. Azam Allah ujurana wa ujurakum. I would like to offer my condolences to the Baqiyatullah to the Imam of our time, Sahib al Asr was the man, Hajjallah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif, and our, and our ulama and scholars, the Maraja, Shia of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim was salam, in this uh, sorrowful occasion, the martyrdom of Imam al Jawad, sallallahu alayhi Who was Imam al Jawad? Imam al Jawad, sallallahu alayhi was the ninth Imam of the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, the ninth representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the vicegerent whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the responsibility of leading the ummah after his father, Al-Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida, the eighth Imam, salawatullahi wa salamu Imam al-Jawad, salamullahi alayhi, he was born in the very late stages of the life of Al-Imam al-Rida, salawatullahi alayhi. Imam al-Jawad was born in the year 195 after Hijrah, specifically on the 10th of Rajab. So Imam al-Rada sallallahu alayhi was approximately around 46 years of his age, his age yep. which was also um, a very troubled time for the Shia. Because the Shia, they always know that there is, there should be a representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times and at all stages. But when they came to notice that Imam al-Rada until 45, until early stages of 46, he still hadn't had an offspring, an heir to continue the line of Imamah, some of them started doubting. Mm. And the enemies of Ahlul Bayt salam, they also took this opportunity to set the doubts mm. in the hearts of the Shia and the Muslims in general. That look, this is Ali ibn Musa Rida, and until here will stop the, the line and the lineage of Rasulullah and the continuation of this school of thought. So, Imam al-Jawad, salamullahi alayhi, his father, Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida, was born in the city of Medina. His mother had many names and titles. Amongst them was Khayzaran. Yep. Uh, some say Rayhan, some say Sabika. And her lineage went back to Maria al qibtiya mm. the wife of the Holy Prophet. Prophet of Islam sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. So he lived for approximately 17 years. He became an imam. He, be, he lived for 17 years with his father. He became an imam at the age of eight. Mm. 
and the total lifespan of Imam al Jawad was 25 years, according to some of the well known narrations. <coughs> this is the, the, the general gist of who Imam al Jawad in terms of his, his father, his mother, the, the, the time that he was born in. And he was killed and martyred on, they say, the, the, the end of the Qa'dah in the year 220 mm. AH. So 195 to 220 is approximately 25 years that he was able to serve and be present amongst the Shia and followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam. Ahsantum, and that, that young age is also potentially why he was titled, one of his title, titles is Shababul A'imma, yeah. uh, the youth of, of the Imams. And what other titles were, were given to, to Imam al Jawad? Um, other than al Jawad, which means literally the generous <coughs> one, yeah. because he was so generous at the time that Imam al Rada sallallahu alayhi was all over in Khurasan or Mar. Mm. There were those close to Imam al Jawad of some of the friends or companions to keep him away, to keep him safe from the eyes of, of Ma'moon and Al Mu'tasim. They used to instruct or advise Imam al Jawad not to answer those who come to the door of the house of Imam al Rada alayhi salam from the, main, from the main door. They used to advise him to go and answer them from the back door. Mm. There was another entrance to the house of the Imam. So here, Imam Rada alayhi salam, to highlight the, the generosity of Imam al-Jawad, he would write to him all over from Khurasan to Medina and would say, don't listen to those who tell you to go and answer people from the second entrance. Mm. Make it apparent to everyone that we are Ahlul Bayt al-Karam. We are the household of generosity, of the Jude. So answer people from the main door. This is one of the attributes of Imam al-Jawad, salatullahi alayhi. Another name or another title given to Imam al-Jawad is al-Taqi. Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al-Taqi al-Jawad. Al-Taqi means the pious one. See, he is an example to our youth. He was a young man. And at that climate, similar, maybe that climate was worse than the climate that we are living in. But there wasn't you know, all the worldly desires and the, the life that he, would, he was able to have for himself as a young man, as a handsome, good-looking young man. He was able to have anything he wanted. But at the same time, he chose to be pious. It doesn't mean that he doesn't live his life. No, he lives and enjoys his life. But in the service of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another attribute or another title given to Al Imam Al Jawad that he was titled Ibn al Rida. Mm. Now, some might question why so many names, why so many descriptions, why so many titles? Because the Imam, these Imams of Ahlul Bayt, because Imam, again, one of the other uh, names of Al Imam Al Jawad is. If I'm not mistaken, Abu Ja'far al-Thani. Yeah. These titles or these descriptions were given to the Imam because <coughs> they wanted to dilute the, the climate. It would make it easy for, for the enemies to come and, for example, pinpoint individuals mm. at the time of Imam al-Jawad. So Imam al-Jawad would instruct people to call me Ibn al-Rida, for example, in your letters, in any correspondence. Or call me Abu Ja'far al-Thani. Or they used to narrate, Sami'tu an Abu Ja'far al-Thani, yeah. narrating, he told me so and so. Or an Ibn al-Rida. They won't come out and say, an Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Musa al-Rida. They will say, Ibn al-Rida, al-Taqi, mm. al-Jawad. Another title was al-Murtada. Those who were chosen or were accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or al-radi or al-radi mm. again attributing to 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was pleased with them and they were pleased with whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given them. And another one as mul al muntajab. Al muntajab, those or the one that was set or chosen for a specific duty and obligation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these were the general. Um, of course, he has many other attributes, many other titles. But as time permits, we just mention these Ahsan. titles and attributes of Imam Jawad And Allah. all these titles uh, uh, truly show the, the, the attributes that he had. It shows the way he lived his life. And as you mentioned, uh, Imam Jawad actually had the opportunity to live his life as he wished, especially given the fact that, that he was married to the daughter of the ruler of the time, which, which would have given him a, a lot of freedom, let's say. But he decided that <coughs> Allah Azza wa Jal is, comes first and, and always had Allah in front of him. And that consciousness of Allah Azza wa Jal allowed him to be of those who have taqwa. And the other titles also show that. Yeah. However, uh, we talk about uh, the young Imam Jawad alayhi afsalatu wa salam. And although it's not the first time that someone at a young age was chosen, there were people that had some doubts, yeah. especially his uncles were alive. Um, he had not just his uncles, his grandfather's brothers, uh, some of them were still alive. The, the brothers of Imam Al-Kadhim were still alive. Uh, how did they adjust to that climate? How did they prove his Imam at that young age? Uh, were people in acceptance generally? Um, again, it was... It was um, it wasn't usual for the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, to become Imams at eight. Mm. The majority of the Imams would become Imams at 20, at 30, some at later stages. <laughs> Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was sent to prophethood when he was 40. But then this had to happen to test the obedience of the Ummah whether they are going to stick to the actual norm of age plays a role in whether I follow someone, I listen to someone, I let an eight-year-old or a young person dictate how I live my life. Because this is the same discussion that happened at the time, at the end of the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the whole episode of, of uh, Jaysh Osama. Yeah. When we had companions or so-called companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi arguing or debating why we who sacrificed and lived for 60, 70 years and we've been with Rasulullah from the beginning, we have to go and follow an 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. Now Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi made it very clear. Not only in that occasion, other occasions when he sent, he used to send young men as representatives. For example, he was, he was in, in, in Mecca and he sent a young man to represent him in Medina, to pave the way for Rasulullah. Mm. So here, when Imam al-Radha sallallahu wa sallam wanted to introduce the next representative, the next heir, the next Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he used to invite his companions and his close friends to be familiar with this young Imam. For example, close companions and followers of Imam Radha alayhi salam would enter upon him. Imam Radha sallallahu alayhi would invite Al Imam Al Jawad, Abu Ja'far sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he would inform them that, that he is the Imam after me. Mm. They used to question the possibility of the Imam. The Imam السلام, would answer. And this is what Imam Jawad السلام, later on he used to use verses of the Holy Quran to inform them that this is not something new in the path of their prophets and the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Holy Quran does specifically outline the fact that we as the people um, we as representatives we as the ones who send representatives and messengers to the mankind we send them some of them are at a young age 
فور اكزامبل نبي يحيى واتيناه الحكمه صبيا يا يحيى خذ الكتابه بقوه اور ان تايمز وير الله سبحانه وتعالى سبيكينج اباوت بروفيت عيسى عليه السلام وير هي سيز هي سبيكس وين هي از ان ذا كريدل اني عبد الله اتاني الكتابه وجعلني نبيا فور اكزامبل امام الجواد عليه السلام يوست تو ان هيز ديبيتس برينج اوت ذس ذات الله سبحانه وتعالى انهرتد نبوة سليمان after داود mm. Again إمام رضا صلى الله وسلم عليه would come and say that ما ولد مولود أعظم بركة منه على شيعتنا This young Imam this newborn he will be so full of blessings upon our Shia that's, that none before him carried this blessing So, Imam alayhi salam, Imam al was preparing the Shia from an early, early time in the life of Imam al-Jawad to be acquainted with the Imam being an Imam at an early stage, at an early age. So, for example, he would take him with you when he w- take him with him. Imam al <coughs> would take and accompany Imam al-Jawad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi with him when he went to um, attend for example, discussions, or in the masjid, Imam al-Jawad alayhi salam would be answering some, some questions in the presence of his father. But then there were the specific time where uh, Imam al-Rada sallallahu alayhi was forced to leave Medina and go towards Maru and Khurasan. Mm. So who was the Imam's representative in Medina? Amongst the representatives of Imam was Imam al-Jawad salamu alayhi Of course, he wasn't the only one because Imam, Imam Rada would want to do his best to protect the life of Imam al-Jawad. So there will be other deputies, there will be other agents answering the questions of the Muslims and the Shia. But again, at certain times, in very difficult circumstances and difficult discussions and, co- and questions, they would have to return to Imam al-Jawad, salam Allah mm. So, it was, at the same time, it was something very surprising, but at the same time, it was something that everyone was comfortable and happy to see that the line of Imam continues, even at the young age of Imam al-Jawad, salam Allah and here, as you mentioned, that there were people that even doubted the presence of a young Imam. Yeah. The uncle of Imam al-Jawad, the brother of Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rada. Yeah. Um, his name, Abdullah ibn, Abdullah ibn Musa, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. the, the cousin, uh, the, the uncle of Imam al-Jawad. He was one of those who doubted and called people towards um, himself himself, and then when they used to go to him and ask him his que- their questions he wasn't able to answer they would leave him and return to Al-Imam Al-Jawad and famous narration saying Inna akhi Abdullah la yuhib an yu'abadullah Ahsent my, my brother Abdullah my, the, the, who's called the worshipper of Allah he doesn't, doesn't love for Allah to be ahsent. worshipped again um, at the time of Ma'moon because Imam Al-Jawad alayhi salam he lived for 23 years in the time of the, the, the power of Al-Ma'moon, mm. Al-Abbasi. Again, Ma'moon, um, they, they narrate to him, from him that he was about him that he was some, somehow clever, smart. He brought Imam al-Rada close to him so he can have a close eye, a watch on Imam al-Rada and also convince or try to convince the Shia and the Alawiyin that I have no problems with mm. Bani Hashim. So he wanted to do the same with Imam al-Jawad salam Allahi alayhi. How? By bringing Imam al-Jawad to be under his wings. How? He's a young man. 
he introduced to Imam al-Jawad, come and marry Umm al-Fadl. Mm. Which Imam al-Jawad, alayhi salam, he knew what the, the outcome of this was going to be. He knew why Ma'moon was doing this. But Imam al-Jawad, at the same time as the previous Imams, they were looking at this actual condition not only to benefit, they never looked to benefit their own desires. At, this, at the same time that he was introduced to Umm al-Fadl, he was looking to, to, to satisfy the needs of the Shia. Mm. Because at the time of Imam al-Jawad and Imam al rada the prosecutions and the, the, the torture and the terrorism of Bani Hashim, Alawiyin, the sons of Ali and Fatima continued. Mm. Because Bani al-Abbas continued targeting Ahl al-Bayt alayhim salam So it was for the best interest of the Muslims in general and Bani Hashim and the Alawiyin that Imam alayhi salam for that specific period of time got married to Umm al-Fadl. Um al but again that is another chapter in the life of Al-Imam al-Jawad. But here, <coughs> this is one of the ways that Ma'moon wanted to answer the questions placed forward by Ben al-Abbas themselves, that how yeah. could you draw a, a young individual and give him such prominent position? He used to say to them, okay, if you doubt what I believe in him, you come and question him, debate him, yeah. ask him, prove me wrong. And this is was one of the reasons that why Ma'moon brought an Imam al-Jawad in the very famous narrations that he debated the, the scholars and the judges of, of Baghdad. Yeah, which we'll get to in, in just a second, inshallah, inshallah. as well. Um, the, the debates with those specific individuals and the debates with, uh, with others as well. Uh, I just think it's very important to shed light on, on, the, on this young Imam of Imam al-Jawad yeah. uh, because when we look at our time, and we look at the Imam of our time, we know that the Imam of our time uh, received Imam at the young age of five. Yes. It's important for us to discuss these things. It's important for us to understand how, how it would be. And of course, as you mentioned, the, the, there were prophets before that received uh, prophethood yeah. at a young age. Uh, in, in fact, messengers that received their message because Atani al Kitab, so there was yes. a message there. Yep. And even when we look at the life of the Imams, Amir al Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib at the young age of 10 uh, in Hadith al Dar, received yep. the wasiyah from Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. However, uh, moving on, uh, you mentioned certain aspects uh, during the life. Uh, of Imam al Jawad with Al Ma'moon, marrying the Ma'moon's daughter, uh, being, let's say, one of the main representatives of Imam al Rida alayhi alayhi salam in his absence when he was in Marwa or in Khurasan or in other uh, regions. And it takes me to the political climate that the Imam lived in because, as we know, Al Ma'moon uh, was one of those Abbasids that showed tashayyuh, which tashayyuh doesn't necessarily mean to, for the viewers, doesn't necessarily mean uh, to follow the Ahlul Bayt, but rather to know the status of the Ahlul Bayt. He showed tashayyuh, but behind closed doors, there was a different story going yeah. on. So how, how, how was this balance for, for the Imam? Again, because uh, Bani al-Abbas, specifically uh, Harun, al-Ma'moon, al-Mu'tasim, and the ones that came, uh, afterwards, they wanted to control the political climate mm. because um, the Alawis, it wasn't in their blood to sit down, at least not all of them accepted that the fact that we have to just calm down, stay quiet. Yeah. There, there were segments of the Alawis that continued in their revolutions. I mean, Karbala wasn't the last uprising of Bani Hashim. Mm. After Karbala, there was other, <coughs> other individuals from the household of Ali and Fatima that revolted yeah. or rose against the tyranny of the oppressors. So this continued, this trend continued. At times, the Imam present at that time would 
the least he would say, or the least he would do is not come out and accept that movement or that, rev that the revolution or that uprising. But again, at the same time, he won't speak against it. Mm. But at times, no. You would find that some of the Imams, alayhim salam, they would come out and, and, and deny their followers or their family members to actually engage in acts of revolt and uprising. Why? Because they wanted to consider the greater good of the existence of the Shia and the Muslims. They wanted the honor and dignity for mankind. Mm. They couldn't just sit down and see <coughs> how Bani al-Abbas were just prosecuting and annihilating people left, right and center just because they found someone to carry the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib in their mm. heart. Yani, you think it's going to be easy for, for example, Imam Musa ibn Ja'far or Imam al-Rada or Imam al-Jawad or Imam al-Hadi to have their Shia, their followers, their own family members, their cousins, to be prosecuted because they carry the blood of Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima al-Zahra in their bodies? Mm. I advise my brothers and sisters to go and investigate and read how much the numbers of the Alawiyin, of men and women and children that were imprisoned in the prisons of Harun and Mutawakkil and Ma'moon and Al-Mu'tasim. Yeah. There were in individuals narrating that they would instruct us, these enemies of Allah would instruct us if you want to show how much you accept us and to show your love and devotion to our to our throne and our authority, we instruct you to go and open the doors of these prisons mm. and the and the and whatever you see in front of you, just behead. They narrate that we used to go open the doors of these prisons and we used to behead 60, 70 of the children of Ali and Fatima at one night. SubhanAllah. So why would Imam al Jawad Salamullahi Alay be very careful about the political climate and how he dealt with that political entity, people will think that he's cooperating with them. He is giving in to them. No. The Imam alayhi salam, he had a duty and obligation to play. The well-being of the Shia, the continuation of the message of Ahlul Bayt, the existence of the ulama, the fact that the scholars were present and they were taking that knowledge and preserving that knowledge. Because at the end of the day, Imam alayhi salam, he would have been able to up make a, cause an uprising. Yeah. Just go and fight and either kill or be killed and they would all be annihilated. But what, what Imam wanted was the preservation of the knowledge and the sciences of Ahlul Bayt and to save the lives of the Ummah. They hold a big trust Exactly. Amman. Exactly. Yeah. And at the same time, that was a means for the Imam alayhi salam to show the position of Ahl al-Bayt, mm. the one that was taken away from them. Because if he was not to obey or accept the invitation of Ma'moon to go and debate in Baghdad, then that was a missed opportunity Ahsan. for people and ulama that used to believe that we are the top of the top. That there is no one bigger than us in terms of knowledge. We carry all the knowledge. We are the continuation of the path of the Holy Prophet of Islam and the Quran. Then that was an opportunity missed by Imam al-Jawad al to go and reveal the knowledge that was put out there by Imam al-Sadiq and the Imams before him. And to, to represent and show the true knowledge of the Holy Household uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa uh, Wasallam which then actually leads me on to, to looking at the debates of Imam al-Jawad. Uh, Imam al-Jawad debated with many different individuals. What kind of individuals did he debate with? Uh, what kind of topics did these debates uh, surround? Ahsanto. At the time of Al-Imam, as we discussed in the episode of Imam al-Sadiq Sallallahu Alaihi we did discuss the start of these new schools and these new movements. Yeah. 
that developed into the time of <coughs> Al-Imam Musa ibn Ja'far um, with the Zaydis, the Ismailis, the Waqifiyya, yeah. the um, other schools of thought. So there were individuals at the time of Imam al-Jawad, again, um, what, what was very clear that Bani al-Abbas, they want to show um, the, the Islamic civilization mm. growing. Because some of the titles that were given to some of the, the Islamic capital cities or some Islamic cities at the time of Harun and Ma'mun, for example, in terms of Baghdad, they say Al-Asr al-Dahabi, yeah. the golden times. Why was it the golden time? Because they were building all of these institutes, these schools, these seminaries, these libraries, you know, inviting the ulama of Greece and Persia and, and the, Romans. the Romans to come and debate and negotiate translation, interpretation of their books. The Muslims were taking from them. They were taking from the Muslims. So a Westerner or someone from the West, someone from those regions, when he used to come to Baghdad, he used to see that, wow, look at the civilization, this Islamic Ummah. Look at the, these, these buildings, these schools, these universities, these libraries. This is a great civilization, but they, mm. la they lack to know what was happening behind closed doors. The fact that it was the Imam alayhi salam, Imam al-Jawad, he was moving this debate. Mm. He, was he was the one that was originally preserving and showing and highlighting the true nature of the Islamic civilization. By um, debating, for example, Yahya ibn Akhtham, who was one of the greatest of jurists and ulama at the time of of uh, Al-Imam Al-Jawad and he was close to the courts of Al-Ma'mun, Bani yeah. Al-Abbas. For example, we had another individual by the name of, if I'm not mistaken, Ahmed Ibn Abi Dawood. And they used to give him a title of Qadhi Al-Qudat, the, the, the highest rank of Judges. Judges in Baghdad, Qadi Qudat Baghdad. For example, another individual that used to continuously debate <coughs> and question Imam al Jawad alayhi, was an individual by the name of Abu Hashim al Ja'fari. Mm. Again, these individuals, they were the heads of specific movements, specific ideologies, specific schools that the Imam. It was very important for him to stand against the continuation of this ideology because he used to see that some of the Shia were being brainwashed, were being dragged by these movements. Mm. Again, because the Imam was not always present or the Imam's deputies, they were not always available to answer the questions of the Mu'mineen, of the Shia and the Muslims. For example, an individual from the Ghulat, because mm. the Ghulat again were another group that were very apparent, very open in their ideology at the time of Imam al Jawad. Salam Started Allah increasing during the time of Imam al Jawad, and especially the time of Imam al Hadi as well. Yeah. And these individuals were those who exaggerated mm. some of the positions that were given to Ahlul Bayt alayhim as salam. Al Ghulat. For example, Abu al-Khattab, yep. he is an individual that Imam al-Jawad stood against him very seriously. And there were individuals that the Imam السلام, he openly called for people to execute them. Because their presence amongst the Muslims and amongst the Shia was very dangerous. dangerous. To an extent that they were brainwashing. So the Imam highlighted the fact that there needs to be movements, educational, academic, debates, discussions, negotiations to reveal the true nature of Islam at a time where the, 
the, the political climate and the political environment established and set and which was being fed by Ben Al Abbas was confusing people left, right and center. Mm. Because Ben Al Abbas, they wanted to confuse people. They wanted to put fear and terrorize people. So they come away from Ahlul Bayt. They don't surround Imam Al Jawad. And vice versa, they come towards them. Because, because the more people go towards Ahlul Bayt, the more followers Imam Al Jawad gets, the more of a threat he's going to pose to Ma'moon and his court. And Ben Al Abbas, they didn't want that because <coughs> they have just recently established, you know, taking over power from Bani Umayyah. Mm. And they didn't want it just to end there. So one of the ways was to dilute the knowledge of the Muslims, was to dilute the faith and the belief of the Muslims by bringing other faiths and other beliefs. Yeah. And was also to dilute the fact that we are not allowing you, we will never allow you to establish a relationship or to show your love and affection of Ahlul Bayt by going towards them. Mm. And anyone who was seen to do that, he was terrorized and he was killed. Or the least he was going to be deprived from the financial sustenance. Which once again is the usual uh, Which resort they used to resort to. Which today, in and our today, days, yeah, it we see the Shia of Ahlul Bayt salam, because it of the loss of Ahlul Bayt, they are continuously being terrorized and killed. Yeah, from on the time a, on a daily basis. From the time of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa as soon as he passed away, uh, from the time of Fatima al Zahra, and so on until today, as you mentioned. However, um, uh, to stay on the topic of Imam al Jawad alaihi wasallam and and his debates. Uh, I want to fast forward towards the end of his life and subhanAllah what a, a short life when you think about it, only 25 years. However, on that 25th year of his life, there was a specific debate uh, that he was forced to engage in. Yeah. He didn't want to engage in it. He was forced to engage in it and he was forced to give an opinion on the matter of where the hand of the thief should be cut from. Yeah. And uh, of course, that is one of the events that led to his martyrdom. Uh, could you potentially tell us more about that event and how it eventually led to his martyrdom? Yeah. Um, again, there are many opinions of how the Imam alayhi salam was, or the reasons behind the Imam's death or the Imam's martyrdom. One of the reasons that was, which is, as you mentioned, is um, the debate that was organized by uh, the courtyard of the Abbasiyin to show um, to show the true nature of Imam Al Jawad because mm. Bani Al Abbas they wanted to make it clear to the ruler to the person sitting on the throne that what you see is not what he believes in. Mm. So, for example, Qad Al Qudat. Ahmad ibn Abi Dawood wanted, because people were going towards Imam al-Jawad, but they, they, they weren't going, and that, that is also, you know, going to belittle his, his position. People are not going to think and be fond of his knowledge. They, they are going to stop the financial means going through. And again, the pressure that Bani Umay and Bani al-Abbas were putting on these scholars. Mm. What are you doing? I mean, people are going towards the sons of Ali and Fatima. We are paying you to stop against them. So here, this Qadil al Qudat, the, the supreme judge of Baghdad, he engages in a debate with Imam Salamullah Alayhi where um, the court of Bani al Abbas, they want to get the opinion of the scholars. They had caught or captured a person who had stolen. Yeah. And they wanted to see how they will implement the hukum, whether to cut his arm from the, the elbow, from the mirfaq, from the wrist, from the fingers. So they asked the different scholars and jurists. One of them was this Qad al Qudat, mm. Ahmed ibn Abi Dawood. Ahmed ibn Abi Dawood, he gives an incorrect answer. Or he gives an answer, which was then debated by an Imam al-Jawad. When they come to ask Imam al-Jawad, 
Imam al-Jawad refrained from answering. But then when he was forced and pressurized, he answered the question by saying and quoting a verse from the Holy Quran that his, this thief's hands or this thief has to be, um, the hukum is to cut his fingers and yeah. leave the rest of the hand. When they asked him why, he <coughs> said in the, the ayah in the Holy Quran, in al-masajida lillah, fala tad'u ma'allahi shay'a aw ahada, the, 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 the general gist of the ayah. So the fact that means that there are certain areas of the body that they should not be amputated because they are a sign of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masajid, the, the masajid yeah. is seba, the forehead, the palms, the, the, the knees. knees and the toes. But here, ever since the, the Abbasid ruler taking the, the judgment of Imam al-Jawad and, and raising his position as a result of taking his judgment and his answer and belittling the rest, especially the Supreme Judge, Ahmed ibn Abi Dawood, it was then that this grudge and hatred started in the existence of Ahmed ibn Abi Dawood, mm. the Supreme Judge of Baghdad. <coughs> which resulted in him to coming to Al-Mu'tasim, Al-Abbasi, and continuously urging him to annihilate Al-Imam Al-Jawad because of this hasad, this envy. I can't see a young person, a young Imam at the age of 24 or 25 become more knowledgeable or show that he is more superior in knowledge than me. And this is Afatul Ulama, what they call it, the envy that exists in some of the worldly scholars. Another, another opinion <coughs> is that Imam al-Jawad's wife, Umm al-Fadl, she couldn't see the fact that the Imam had children from other wives. other wives, but he didn't have, and he was closer to other wives and he wasn't to her. Um, so she, again, with the plotting of, if I'm not mistaken, Ja'far ibn, uh, ibn Harun or Ja'far ibn al Ma'mun, they plotted with Umm al Fadl, the Umm um al Fadl's brother, with Al Mu'tasim to annihilate and poison Imam al-Jawad salam alayhi so here Imam al-Jawad salam alayhi um, is given the poison by his wife Umm al-Fadl and he was she was adamant that he took that poison whether, whether it was through a drink or whether it was grapes she enters upon the Imam. The Imam was fasting in the narration. Salamu alayhi wa ummi in the tender age and the heat of the day. So he asks for something to break his fast with. This enemy of Allah comes towards the Imam, carries the plate or the container of, of food which was poisoned, places it in front of Ali Imam al Jawad. Salamu alayhi wa ummi. And the Imam, the Imams usually refrain at the first instance to take, but when they are forced, they they go ahead with what Allah had willed. And she and the Imam alayhi salam took that drink when he started feeling the heat of the poison. He says he faced his wife Umm al Fadl and he said, "Qatiltini ya adwat Allah, what have I done?" to deserve this. Wasn't I a loyal and lawful husband to you? Then, every time the Imam would speak to her, she would remember the Imam and how he reacted towards his other wife. She would leave the Imam السلام, all alone. She had cleared the house, she locked the doors, and she left the Imam just by himself. يتقلب تقلب السليم. Imagine an, a poisoned person all alone. He see, he needs help. He calls for help, but he doesn't find help until the narration say that the Imam 
was wanting to free himself until he reached a high level of the house. It is the roof of the house that the Imam alayhi salam wanted to pass away and die similar to his grandfather Abi Abdullah al Hussein. And this is the general history of Ahl al Bayt. They want to be related to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Imam al Jawad is narrated, he goes onto the palm, the roof of his house, under the scorching heat of the sun. The riwayat say, Baqiya thalathan, three days, he stayed there on the roof of the house, all thirsty, asking for help, asking for water, until he passed away, غريب, and all alone, until the Shia days afterwards, they saw birds rotating around on top of the body of Al Imam Al Jawad. It is then they break in, they go, and they see that it's been three days that the, their Imam alayhi salam had been laying there on the roof of the house scorched by the heat of the sun. <laughs> وإنا إليه راجعون عظم الله لكم الأجر سيدنا أن جزاكم الله خير جزاء for your time and may Allah reward you for the tears that you have brought on as well جزاكم الله خير dear viewers thank you very much for joining us once again إن شاء الله until another time السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته